But once again, all right. Hey, hey everybody, good all. I see everybody once again, um, as well as myself coming back in on board. Uh, once again, this is Anti-Racist Jubilee Symposia, um, hosted by myself and as well as the wonderful Miss Evelyn. Um, today, we are bringing once again our great host and keynote presenter, Angela Chandler, um, who's going to be taking us over our project for defining the cornerstones of diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as access, my apologies, um, with our interactive participatory training that's going to be happening today. So once again, we are the anti-racist uh, jubilee. We're celebrating over education and cultivation. So I definitely love to pass this over to Angela and she'll share more. Ah, thank you, Paul. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I think everybody's in the afternoon now. Um, good morning to those who might be on the West Coast. <laughs> um, so today, um, what I wanted to do, I thought it was really helpful to kind of talk about high level. So racism and race fits into this overall arching concept that we're now hearing more about, which is, you know, DEIA, right? Diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. Um, one of the things I've also noticed is that when people talk about it, they kind of lump all of these terms together and you don't really understand what the difference is between them, how they work together, how they coexist. What is the difference? So I thought it'd be really important to talk about um, how diversity, inclusion, equity, and access, and what they mean in today's world. Um, so, right, this is becoming a very popular thing, especially as we're talking about um, jobs, like, you know, diversity, inclusion is starting to become um, a C-suite or department um, in certain workplaces. I know it's becoming very popular in the government, as you all know. Um, I think most of you all see me present, so I won't go too much into my intro, um, but I do support, I'm a federal government contractor. Um, right now I am supporting um, a VA's uh, ORMDI, which is Office of Resolution Management and Inclusion and Diversity. Um, one of the things they recently did this week, which hit the news, which was a result of the um, office that I'm working with, is they took down some of their initial uh, talks about men being veterans, and they've change the language and this is on like the front door of like their main office so this is pretty big because you know VA has been around for a long time veterans administration and it serves a lot of our citizens um so what they did is actually make the language more inclusive to be inclusive of families of veterans women veterans as well as um the LGBTQ plus community as well so that's one pretty historic thing um the other thing that um I've also done has been researching you know how other um government agencies are doing with in inclusion and diversity. So it's pretty popular um, topic right now in the workforce, um, depending on where you look at. Other news sources are saying, you know, as, as, as our economy is shrinking, that's kind of the first area to get cut. So um, so definitely, you know, it's in the news, more much, much more popular subject nowadays. Um, so anyways, without further ado, I will jump into um, today's, let me share my screen. And I will go into present mode. Can everyone see my screen? Thumbs up, yay. Okay, great. All right, so um, this is going to be a four part series. Um, so today we're gonna to be focusing on just diversity and in the future weeks, we'll talk about inclusion. Um, we'll go through equity and then we'll go through access, right? We're gonna go through all four of these in different sessions. Um, and if there's one area that you know we can pull out, there are certain areas I'm definitely comfortable about talking, um, other areas, not so much. Um, so you know, uh, definitely if there's, you know, you wanna learn more in the future, just, just let me know. Um, all right, so ground rules. Um, you all have seen this before. I'm gonna reiterate it. This is a learning opportunity. I like to, the way I like to do these is, is teach, learn, and then we discuss. So for today's presentation, it'll be a little bit different. I usually do an icebreaker up front. Um, what I'm gonna do is present all the information and then we're gonna have a discussion at the end. And I want it to be interactive. It's gonna be more discussion style um, and sharing. Personal reflection is, is also part of it. Um, there are no dumb questions. Uh, this is a psychologically safe space. Uh, I will say, you know, I've said it before, there, there's not much that you can ask me that I haven't already heard before um, through my lived experiences working in this topic. So there are no dumb questions. If you are uncomfortable with asking a question, you can feel free to send a chat directly to me in Zoom um, and keep it anonymous and I can answer your question that way. 
please uh, listen with an open mind. Uh, be courteous to others that are sharing. Today's topic is going to talk about diversity, and I do encourage us to talk about self-reflection. Um, so please, please be courteous to each other as others are sharing, because this is a really good learning opportunity. I think for all of us, I will definitely learn during this session, and I'm sure you all will as well. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have dogs over here that are interviewing with my presentation. Um, uh, so please, um, I think this group is really good about not taking over, you know, the discussion um, and the topic. So I don't really want to go into that too much. Again, it's okay to disagree. Um, I'm not sure how much disagreement that'll happen during this presentation today, but you know, as long as you disagree, do it with respect and empathy and uh, do it based on facts um, and not, you know, personal rhetoric or feelings. And please stay on topic. Again, we're talking about diversity today. Um, let's, you know, I'll address the other topics. So, um, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. I'll address the other topics and define them, but it'll help us stay on topic today as we talk about diversity. There's a lot to talk about within diversity. Um, so let's let's try to stay within those boundaries um, and barriers. Um, and also be courteous, cur curious and, and humble. All right. So um, so you'll see a couple intro slides. You will see these same intro slides if you all are available for the next coming weeks. Um, so diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. What are the definitions? So I have these laid out here. Um, you can see diversity is bolded at the top because that's the one that we are focusing on today. Diversity includes all the ways which people differ, right? This is what makes us unique. Um, it should be celebrated. And unfortunately, in today's society, it's not always celebrated. It's used to oppress. So we're going to talk a little bit about that um, and what makes um, that, that aspect up. Um, and that's for, an, you know, one individual or, you know, a group um, from another. So it's all of our differentiating factors. Um, inclusion, so that is the act of creating environments in which an individual or a group can participate. They feel welcome, respected, supported, so on and so forth. Um, so that's inclusion, right? Um, and I'll, I'll have a graphic next that kind of pulls this all together so you can visually see it. I know we might have different types of learners. Um, so there's some that learn through imagery, others, you know, again, learn from reading. Um, so I have both. So we'll get to that in a sec. Um, so equity is having the uh, opportunity to fully participate. And again, we're not talking about these. I just want to create kind of the boundaries of what each of these mean. Um, and we'll talk about how it's inclusive of racism and things like that when we go through the presentation. And then access is the commitment for everyone to be included. OK. I see a couple in the chats. OK, I just want to make sure there was nothing to me. All right. All right, so this is an image that I found that I think is really helpful when talking about how all of them uh, fit together to, to create the pie, right? So you have people, we are all different, right? And these are some of the characteristics. So I'll jump into characteristics today of what makes us different. Um, and that'll be part of our talk as well. So you have all these people, you know, with different um, gender identities, you know, races, political affiliations, uh, you know, ethnicities, origins, so on and so forth, right? Those are the people that that this is where we sit as people. And then when you're thinking about um, the rest, you know, the inclusion, so on and so forth, um, you have programs that are inclusive, right? So when you're developing a program or you're developing something for public consumption, whether it's an initiative, whether it's a business, whatever that may be, how are you doing that to make inclusive? I will give one example, um, and it is from a woman's perspective, not to alienate the men, but um, I was scrolling through on Facebook and I saw, and it's winter time here as well as it might be for most of you. And I was scrolling through and they have these, what now are lined leggings uh, for women. Um, for pantyhose, right? So it looks like pantyhose, um, but there's actually a layer of fleece underneath, which as we all know, you know, it can be really cold to go out in a skirt uh, and just pantyhose when it's like sub 30 weather. Um, however, they made this product with only one race in mind. There was like two shades of nude and nude, you know, a beige, and that was about it. And this company got ripped. Like I was looking on Facebook and so many people chimed in from all different cultures saying, why don't you have more shades? I mean, even people, Caucasian people were talking about it. They were like, this shade doesn't fit me. It's way too light. 
So, I mean, there was complaints across the board. So when you're, you know, building your, your products, what, regardless of what it is, think about how you're being inclusive because it's a great product. I mean, hands down, I probably would have bought it, but seeing you had three shades, like, I mean, I, I have Caucasian friends as well. And I, my mom's on the call as well. I don't think any of those shades would have fit her either. So, you know, when you're developing things and thinking about things that that's kind of, you know, that's the inclusion part. Um, all right, I'll, I'll keep going. So um, practices is equity, right? So when you're thinking about that, how do you develop equity um, for everyone that's gonna use it or, or be part of it? So those are practices. And this kind of goes into the legal, right, as well. Equity is, is a legal more term and we'll, we'll see that. Um, and you'll see that when we get to that part of the presentation. And access is being able to open the door. If I'm a diverse person with all of my you know, diversity, whatever those elements are, can I walk through that door to even be included to, to get the equity? So um, that's a little bit about how it works. Um, equal opportunity. And again, the people are one thing, the programs, the practices, those are all the legal system. So when we talk about systemic racism, it's the programs, it's the businesses, it's the practices, it's the legal system. These are the things that make it difficult, right? Um, so anyways, it's the structure. So when we talk about um, when we talk about racism and being systemic, this is kind of where it is. Programs aren't inclusive. Practices aren't equitable. You can't get in the door, right? I see a bunch of chats. <laughs> 36 plus. <laughs> um, all right. So going to the next slide. So again, we're just talking about diversity today. So let's go ahead and jump into our topic. All right, so diversity refers to all the ways in which people are different, right? How do we differ? Um, we're all different. We all have our unique experiences, but really diversity is broken down into two characteristics. There's primary characteristics. Those are very visual, and we'll talk a little bit about those. And then there's secondary characteristics. And this is really about your personal and lived experiences. And there's a lot of these, and we're going to go through these two. And you'll hear me talk about um, primary and secondary, and it's really important to understand these. And if you all have heard me talk, you also hear me talk about biases. So a lot of these aspects of diversity also influence our bias as well for various reasons. All right, so like I said, we have primary and secondary characteristics. So I went and had and explained this a little bit more. Um, I also really like the image of the hand because it's one thing that I think, you know, most um, a fully functioning, I'll say, uh, humans have. Um, again, that goes into uh, physical abilities and disabilities for those who might not have one, but really it, it encompasses, right? Our fingerprint is supposed to be unique. Um, so it's, it's a unique characteristic or trait to us. So that's a little bit about the imagery there. So primary Mary characteristics are usually the most visible, right? So they're the ones that you can see when you look at a person. Um, and then secondary characteristics are those non-visible ones, right? Those are the ones that biases, you know, really can come out that you make assumptions. Oh, they must be, you know, so-and-so. I know from my experience, a lot of people have made assumptions about me. And I will say 95% of the time they are incorrect. Um, so, and this, you know, comes from basically how you've lived your life. And I'll talk a little bit. And again, we're going to go into depth of both of these. Um, but this is really, really important when you're looking at diversity, um, and looking at, you know, all the different aspects of it. All right, so primary characteristics. So on your left side, we have race, body size and type, age and gender or, or sex. So these are primary characteristics that when you look at someone, excuse me, you can see almost right away. Um, race is, you know, high level. It's uh, Caucasian, Black or African American, Indian or Alaska Native, IPI, Latina, so on and so forth, right? That is your race. It is a high level characteristic. It's usually based on your skin tone or your characteristics. Body size and tape, body size and type. Um, as we know, there's a lot of body shaming um, that has happened uh, within America and abroad. Um, this is, you know, something that is, you know, pretty, 
I mean, I think every culture every around the world deals with this for, for various reasons. You're either too big, you're too small, you're too tall, you're too short, right? So there's these standards of beauty that are always shifting, always changing. Um, and, and, and that, you know, kind of fits into diversity. We're all built a little bit different. We all have, you know, there's some standard body types, but again, you know, the way we live our lives and all the factors that go in influence these things. Age, there's ageism. You know, some people may may look older or younger based on the life that they live, but in general, you can, you know, usually tell people's, you know, generation by how they act or, you know, things that they say. Um, and that, you know, contri contributes to its own type of bias as well. Um, and gender and sex, right? So this is, again, something that's visible, um, you know, for the most part. And, you know, unless you really take on that androgynous look, um, you know, you're going to be able to tell if it's, it's a male or female just by your attributes. So on the right-hand side, uh, I go into some, pri some things that can be primary characteristics, but some of them can also be secondary characteristics. It really just depends on the person um, and, and what their gender identity is, and if it is different from what they were born with, um, and how they express their gender, right? So that's going to look a little bit different for every person, and that is going to be unique. Um, it is about how they look at themselves and how they feel most comfortable in their own skin. Uh, religion, um, right? So this is one that I will say this doesn't only, uh, you know, apply to people who come from, you know, community of Islam or Muslim, um, you know, we just had Lent. So, you know, Christians or, you know, we're walking around, I saw a whole bunch of, ash, you know, ashes, and I was like, oh, you came from church, um, you know, when I was at the gym, or just walking around in the grocery stores. So there's different aspects if you're wearing a rosary, okay, you know, okay, I can assume you're Catholic, um, right? So those are some, sometimes those are primary key characteristics. Um, and sometimes they may not be. It just it just depends on how people are, you know, um, how they go out for the day and what their experiences have been. Um, so that's the short list for primary characteristics. There's a lot of secondary characteristics. Um, and I know there's more. I just kind of captured, so you can see there's three slides. Um, I just tried to capture the main ones, the high level ones, and some of these connect. Um, and some of them act independently. So I'll go through these and please pay attention as we're, as we're, cause I'm gonna ask you all to, to talk about this. So part of the discussion is identifying, you know, you know, and doing some self-reflection using these terms, right? To talk about it. So the reason I really enjoy doing this and talking about this from an educational point of view is because it gives us standardized terms. Right. So like one of the things I remember um, was so like it can be frustrating when you're like trying to get to know someone um, is, you know, like tell me to describe yourself. And people use words that are very, you know, that, that they kind of identified in their head as this is what it means. They have their own meaning. So when you talk in terms like this, it is standardized definitions that allow you to talk and communicate. And now we're on the same page, right? Geographical location is geographical location. You know, you can identify it over different parts of the world, but we all have the kind of the same idea of what geographical location is. Right. If I say Asia, we, we know where we're going now, which country in Asia that may be a little bit different, but we understand that, you know, geographical location is tied to Asia. Right. It's tied to Australia, it's tied to our continents, our countries, so on and so forth. Right. So that's that's um, one reason I want us to really think about this and, and try to pay attention. If you need me to flip through slides and go back and forth, I'm happy to do so. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the secondary characteristics. Uh, so one is really neurodiversity and cognitive disabilities. Um, so this is one, you know, where we encapsulate it within mental health. Um, that's how we're talking about it. But there are pure disabilities that people have. It impacts their ability, their, their memory, their ability to problem solve. Uh, their attention spans, uh, verbal uh, communications, nonverbal communications, reading math and visual comprehension. Um, and then it's also categorized, you know, in neurodiversity. Um, this can include people that are labeled with, you know, uh, dyslexia, ADHD, uh, autism spectrum, Tourette syndrome, and others. Um, so thinking about those, those things are not always visible. Um, they might come out through conversations, through, you know, experiences, you know, if you're out to dinner, that those, you know, things might come out. Um, if you're at a conference with someone, they might show, but, 
you know, those are until you, those are not surface level elements that you can really distinguish by just looking at someone. Another characteristics, again, that makes this all different. Um, and this is kind of a high level one is geographical location. Um, like, you know, if you grew up in Thailand, your experiences are going to be very, very, very different than someone who grew up in Madagascar. Um, you know, they're not that far from each other on the map, but, you know, but still, you know, your experiences are going to be very, very different. Um, and those uh, encompass things like culture, language, education, social roles are going to be different. Um, and I'll talk a little bit and break some of those down. Um, so education that I mean, I think we talked about that last month. Um, during the topic when we were talking about, you know, how did we get here? Why is police, police brutality such a thing? Um, everyone's education is different. We weren't taught certain things in our history classes. Um, you know, I, I know I've talked to different people from, you know, around the globe. And, you know, I, I talked to a gentleman, I think he was from Jamaica, and he was like, yeah, we learned world history, and he grew up there. And I was like, oh, that must have been nice. I, I, I only had the option of European history. Um, but he literally had learned different world histories. So when I was talking to him, he was like, yeah, I know what this is, that is, so on and so forth. Education systems are so different. Um, even across the US, they're different, right? Depending on how it's funded. Um, we talked a little bit last time about how uh, the legal system is set up, right? So you have your federal, you have your state, and then you have your local. Um, all of those are also tax brackets, right? And those taxes influence how much goes into education depending on where you live and, you know, in your geographical location, at least in America, um, right? So those are highly influenced. Uh, income, right? Income plays a major role in people's lives, especially, you know, if you have kids. Um, that really impacts, you know, how you live your life, what you have access to, so on and so forth. Um, some additional characteristics, socioeconomic status. Marital status. Yes, it is. You know, we hear this all the time. Oh, are you going to get married? Oh, you're, you know, what's the next step? What's going on? Um, marriage is a big decision. It's a huge decision. Any of you, uh, any of us, I'll include myself um, as a married woman who has been married or been in a relationship, it, it, it can, it can change your life depending on who you marry. You marry someone in the military, you're move, you could be moving every two to three years, right? That's going to change your, your experiences, your life, all of that. Um, you marry into a cultural family that might change how you do holidays. So, right. So those are things that are secondary characteristics, uh, parental status, right. When you decide to, you know, you're getting married and you take the next step or, you know, you become a parent, uh, through other means, um, that changes things. Right. So that's another thing, you, you know, and those, those can be visible sometimes, but not as much, um, so those are other characteristics. You know, if you're a pregnant woman, that can be noticeable. If you have kids at home, uh, people may or may not notice. Um, but that is another factor of diversity. It's something that makes us different, different lived experiences. Criminal background. Uh, so this is one I could easily do it my own deep dive. We talked a little bit about this last week um, with, you know, police brutality and things like that. Um, as we know, it, for a certain People of certain color, it doesn't take a lot to, to get caught by the police or get questioned or potentially arrested, even if there's no final charges that, you know, result of it. Um, so, but that has a big influence as well. Morals, right? So everyone has a slightly different moral compass of what they think is wrong or right, um, right? Or what they think is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, and depending on where you fit in that spectrum, that really influences, again, um, how you think and how you interact with the world. Social roles, right? So this is something else. We, you know, depending on where you're raised, you have different social roles. Um, and this can change by ge ge geographical location. It can change by the neighborhood. Um, it just, it, it changes depending on where you go. But these are certain things that really influence uh, people as they're growing up um, as they, you know, exist in everyday life. Is there any questions? Sorry, I feel like I've just been talking and going and I'm trying to monitor the chat, but. Yeah, I, I have a question. Um, sure. You use the term race as, as a, a definition of, of uh, differences. Uh, and I've led to believe that race is something created by racists. 
um, who wanted to differentiate us on a basis that didn't count. It wasn't real. Is there a different word or something better to use than that word? Could be. I just don't think as a society we've gotten there yet, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so I think, you know, one of the reasons different people use races is a, is an identifier. I think if we just use it as an identifier and, and didn't have all these other biases associated with it, it wouldn't be such a, um, a heavy word that's used to, you know, diversify. I think the connotations and the biases that are attached to race are what make it a negative thing. Because with it, you have, you know, these, these ideologies, Asians are supposed to be X, Black people mm -hmm. are X, you know, Black or African Americans are X, uh, APIs are X, so Latinas are X. And so you put, you know, those races into those boxes and they don't always fit. But yeah, so I will say from my perspective, I prefer, I mean, races, eh, I prefer ethnicity. Um, I'll get to that. I think it's on the next slide. Um, when I talk in those terms, I prefer to ter ter talk in terms of ethnicity. I think it's a much more defining characteristic. Um, and I'll actually jump to that. I think that's a good segue, um, is ethnicity, because this encapsulates things like uh, language. It encapsulates culture. Uh, we talk about food, food, right? So every, you know, ethnic origin has its own food. Um, that is, you know, kind of a cool thing to experience. You experience ethnicities. You don't really experience, I mean, you do experience race because of the biases that's happened. But, you know, as you experience other cultures, you're experiencing their ethnicity. Um, you don't experience their race, if that makes sense. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and one of the things also, I when I do talk to people, I find ethnicity very fascinating. And I will say I've definitely seen people and I'm like, I really want to know where you're from. And instead of like making an assumption, I will ask, what is your ethnicity? I don't ask what is your race. Da, 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 I don't, I don't, you know, but I will ask what is your ethnicity. And for someone who is biracial and has, you know, a very unique ethnicity or ethnicities, I do appreciate that question more so than anything else. What is your ethnicity? You get down to the very, you know, it allows people to talk about, you know, their experience um, with being this, this ethnic person, regardless of what it is. Right. You know, I could, um, you know, we all have different ethnicities, Bob, I could ask you yours and you might tell me Scandinavia, you know, so it really you know, it goes into more than just just race. Any other questions before I go through these last few? All right. Um, so some more secondary characteristics, um, and these are, again, unique to everyone. Um, ethnicity, uh, cultural background, right? Those are a little bit different. Um, political beliefs. Oh, yes, we all have those in this. And this is not just in America. This is across the, you know, the world. Uh, religious and spiritual, right? Those, those are different as well. Um, sometimes you can tell by looking at someone. Sometimes you cannot. Uh, skills. What skills have you acquired throughout your life? You know, do, are you a really good woodworker? And that's what you like to do in your spare time, you know, a painter, things like that, that yet again, differentiate us, but it also can bring us together. Job function. Oh, we know this. I will say, you know, from someone living in the Washington DC metro area, asking someone what they do for a living is a very common question. Um, when people, so I'll talk a little bit about culture. When people move from out of state here and they're like, oh my gosh, people are always asking me what I do. And I'm like, yeah. It is a very popular and normal question based on this area to ask, you know, what do you do for a living? Because people want to network, right? They want to know where you sit, who do you work for, do we have things in common, so on and so forth. I talk about my job a lot because I work, you know, I support the federal government. There's a lot of us here that do that. So, you know, um, so anyways, that goes into six degrees of separation, so on and so forth. Um, job, so within your job, what kind of status or seniority do you have? You know, when someone comes in, they're like, oh, I'm C-suite, you know, I'm a chief medical officer at, you know, so-and-so hospital. 
it's, you know what I mean? That's going to carry weight um, versus saying, you know, oh yeah, I'm a lab tech. You know, it just, unfortunately it does. It's, it's, it's a different conversation. Um, military experience, uh, and this goes again, not just the United States, but abroad as well. Ideologies, you know, so what do you, what do you personally believe in? Um, you know, that can be outside of religious and spiritual beliefs. Um, what do you support? You know, some people, they support skiing. They're like, oh, all my vacations, all my life is all winter, right? I don't, you know, I don't really want to be in the hot sun. I, I want to enjoy Antarctica and, you know, and, and Canada during the winter. So again, ideologies, preferences, uh, family and upbringing. We know how influential it is. I could do a whole presentation on just family and upbringing. Uh, citizenship status. And then of course, language, uh, linguistics um, and accents are also uh, secondary characters. And this, and you'll see language, linguistics and accents just across America, right? You know, depending on where the New York accent, right? The Southern accent. Um, so yeah, you know, there, there's, different, there's different ways that people say things. All right, how are we doing on time? All right, one thirty. okay. So let's next uh, jump into when all of these things come together, you now have intersectionality. We've talked about this before um, briefly during the topic. So I was like, oh, it's an opportunity to talk about intersectionality. So when all of these primary and secondary things come together, um, you have what's called intersectionality and it makes us who we are. Right. So you'll see these kind of like large Venn diagrams of how all of these things come together. Um, and this coin, this term was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit um, as well as the origins, because, um, again, I, you know, it's important to understand when this you know, term came up, how long it's been in existence, so on and so forth. So um, you'll see this again, and I'm happy to flip back to it. Um, but yeah, this is this is the big topic. I'll go through that and then we'll have our discussion. All right. So uh, Dr. Kimberly Cren Crenshaw, she first coined the term um, intersectionality in her 1989 paper, um, demarginalizing the intersection of race and sex. Um, and really her analysis came out because she noticed that as you know, the, the legalization of, of women's rights um, and civil rights really overall, um, was coming to fruition in America, she realized that, you know, the Black woman was having a very different experience in America than, than their white counterparts. And when they were trying to come together as a movement, she noticed our problems. Yes, we have the same problems, but once you start delving into things and getting into those details, we do not have the same problems. Um, Black women, um, often have to work because the men have been marginalized and can't make the same amount of money, the women have to work too. Whereas, you know, Caucasian women, their focus was how do I be the best homemaker I can be? And how do I utilize those skills in the workplace, right? So that is a very, very different conversation. Um, you know, I'm making a, literally a sing, you know, I'm being a homemaker to a single family home versus a black woman who's like, well, I have an apartment that's, you know, 1400 square feet. There, there's not really an opportunity to make this a home and because I can't live elsewhere, because we can't make the money, so on and so forth. So that was kind of the origins of where she really started understanding there's other nuances that, um, that, that make us who we are. And all these nuances really impact the problems that we have in today's society. And it makes up who we are as people. Um, so again, you'll see kind of, you know, these uh, graphs, I kind of pulled this one up on the left, um, uh, which, you know, I, again, covers a lot of the primary and secondary characteristics um, that I talked about. Um, and basically, what, what is the definition? It is a framework for conceptualizing a person, group of people, or social prob problem as effective, as affected by several, several discriminations and disadvantages. Um, so it's basically an intersectional theory uh, that asserts that people can be disadvantaged by multiple sources of oppression, right? So I really brought in that secondary definition because it's, it's uh, to Bob's point, we're using race, you know, it can be just a, you know, explanatory phrase. Unfortunately, people are also using it to, you know, to bully, to make fun of, to make themselves feel better than because you are different. 
right? So when we look at things from an objective stance versus a subjective stance, especially when you get into these secondary characteristics, it really changes things, right? And I really encourage people, again, in the ground rules when I talk about be curious, is take an objective approach, ask questions. So when someone tells me, oh, I believe in this, and I'm, and instead of me being like, well, you shouldn't agree with that, 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 that you know, now we're combative, now we're defensive, right? So now you have to take it in a different approach. My favorite thing to say is tell me more. Tell me more about why you believe that. And you're going to start to see these characteristics that come out of upbringing, friend, you know, my personal experiences. This has molded me into the person that I am. And now you can have a conversation because I guarantee you, even if that person hasn't had the same exact experiences, you can pull it to a high level and be like, yeah, I had a really, you know, blob, you know, X person in my life who really, you know, was fanatic about even if it's a totally other topic, you know what I mean? And so now you can relate. So, you know, there's different opportunities to relate within. This. All right. Um, so let's see. Any other questions about intersectionality before we keep going? Nope. Okay. All right. So now it's time for discussion. Um, so I will open up the floor for anyone to share. I can start off a little bit to, to get us started. Um, so again, my name is Angela Chandler. I live in the Washington, D.C. area, Fairfax, Virginia, to be specific, um, for county. Um, so what are some characteristics that compile your intersectionality? Um, well, I will say some primary ones, um, which again, a lot of people make assumptions. Um, I am biracial. Um, I am also bicultural. So, you know, a lot of people make the assumption that I am Latina. Nope. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, my ethnicity is Nigerian. Um, you know, my mom's ethnicity is Caucasian. So, you know, there's a lot of things that connect that make us who we are. I grew up in, you know, upper middle class. That gives me an element of privilege. Um, I don't want to go into privilege, but I'm just saying, you know, that gives me an element of things that, you know, of access of things that, you know, others may not have had. I grew up outside a major metropolitan city versus, you know, rural um, suburbs. I enjoy that. So those are kind of the things that shape who I am. Um, I grew up Christian and I'm still Christian, right? Um, again, that was something that happened in my upbringing. I grew up in the church, you know, that set my moral compass and my morality. Um, and that shapes the world that I know. So those are just a few things um, that we can use to describe ourselves um, and how those things come together to make us who we are. Um, so anyways, um, I will open up the floor now to anyone else who wants to share and, and really take the time to you know reflect. And from, for I will say all of us, I think it's a very interesting opportunity to learn um, right? We're all different. What makes us different? What are some of the influences that have made us who we are? Um, and how did we get that way? Did we challenge those or did we not? You know, one of the things I also say is, you know, when we grow up underneath parents, you know, we either tend to be just like them or not like them. There are certain things that I'm like, oh, I'll never do that. And, you know, I end up doing it. Um, but, you know, other things I'm like, no, I just don't like that and I won't do it. So, um, so yeah. I would like to hear from everyone else about what their experiences are with intersectionality and how they're re recognizing how these primary and secondary characteristics really make up who they are and how it makes them unique. Yeah, I guess that way. Um... I'm Paul Jackson from Miami, Florida. Uh, characteristics that compile myself, my ethnicity, uh, African American, uh, both my parents. <laughs> One's from Miami, Florida. Family's originally from Georgia. If we trace it back from slavery, then from my mother's um, aspect is from Ohio. And I believe hers is like from Michigan and somewhere else. I forget. Um, but 
one thing that I wanted to make a connection to, especially just like being a teacher, when I see just like education, my own ethnic, or just coming up middle, upper class, similar, or just working class, to then seeing like in the city, uh, the different characteristics of how people can portray Blackness in comparison to those, which has been like an interesting assessment for myself, uh, especially for those who've only seen just one area or aspect of like Miami, Florida, in comparison to not ever leaving Miami, Florida themselves. Um, or sometimes I struggle in the sense of having that conversation to really relate or even if they might even care <laughs> to have that understanding where I, I question like it's even necessary to have or engage the conversation. So I would even ask you like what would be the best way of um, maybe it's like a, a boundary template for myself to just correct or reassure someone to properly educate um, in a sense of making connections of understanding ideas of race or um, yeah, diversity, sorry. I would say, so to begin, you have to make sure it's a psychologically safe space. Um, that's first, because if you go in and you know you start asking questions and it's not there, then that's how you get that defense, right? And we're both defensive. Um, so start small, um, you know, set the parameters of the conversation. Um, inform the person and be like, hey, I would like to learn more about you and X. Is it okay if we have this conversation? Right? So first set the boundary and, and make sure the person's open to having the conversation. Because I'll say most days I am very open to having conversations on race, ethnicity, so on and so forth. And I will be honest, there's certain days I don't want to have it. After the insurrection happened, I, I'm not in the mood to talk about this. I, you don't, yeah, I need to calm my emotions and calm everything before I can open up and have this conversation. So I would say start with that and then explain the terms of the conversation. Um, make sure the person's on board and that way you can actually have the conversation instead of, you know, building up these defenses. Um, that's how I would suggest to have it. And that way that person knows okay, I have to get ready for this conversation. Am I mentally prepared to have it? And they can give you the answer. And if they say no, you have to respect it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, set the ground. Be like, hey, I would really like to talk to you about this. Is this okay? And then ask them, is there anything that you don't want to talk about? Make note of it. And then, you know, stay away from it. Um, and, and respect their boundaries and create your own if you have to. But prepare yourself, you know, the same way, you know, you, you prepare yourself to, to get up and go out for the day. You know, you get up, you, I, I don't know, most people's routines, but mine is, you know, I take a shower in the morning. If I don't, oh, I'm a mess. So, you know, I need to get up and get that. Even if I've showered the night before, that is part of my morning routine. It must happen in order for me to wake up and be the person you see me to be. So, you know, it's the same thing you do for yourself in the morning to prepare yourself for the day. Am I going out? You know, is it cold outside? Is it warm outside? You know, those do those same preparations going into a conversation. Ask them if they're okay. You know, check in. If you're five minutes into the conversation, you're still going, are you still comfortable with talking about this? Thank you, you know, make it easy. Make it easy. And then listen. Active listening is so important. Don't listen to reply. Listen to, you know, don't listen to reply. Say what you heard back. Like, so I heard you correctly. Is this what you said? Okay, now you can respond. That helpful? Oh, yes. No, thank you. Sure. All right. Anybody else? Jump in. I'll jump in here. So along the lines of what we're talking about, and um, just to follow your lead there, Angela, my name is uh, Liz Palacino, and I live in Chicago land. It has been interesting the last three years because um, I've lived in Chicago in um, a neighborhood, for those of you familiar, called uh, Lakeview. And I've lived there for probably 30 years, minus the last three. I've been living in Orland Park because of COVID with my mom. So I've definitely seen and experienced um, different uh, takes on race in the two communities. It was a little bit of a an awakening. And I recently went to a town hall for uh, Sean Keston, the congressman for, um, I think it's six or three, I forget, with um, gerrymandering. And um, the audience there versus the town hall I had gone to in Chicago. 
was very different. So um, I picked up on that. So I am Caucasian, but I often do present as um, Latina. I have people speak to me in Spanish, and unfortunately, my high school Spanish doesn't help. And I think I offend people sometimes when I, I let them know that I'm um, actually not a Latina. I'm a Christian, and uh, along the lines of what we're talking about, there have been some uh, backlashes with uh, being a Christian, with the white Christian um, supremacy, awful, and also I'm a Catholic, so what's going on in the Catholic Church, so observing all of that. And a couple more things. I'm the uh, daughter of an immigrant from uh, Italy. My grandparents were born in Italy, so different experience with that culture where they're actually dying off. So unfortunately, I'm losing some of that. And um, the last thing I want to mention, and I've seen this more in the last six years, I'll just say possibly contributed by our political climate, that um, I've personally faced uh, more patriarchy than I have as a woman in the last six years. And I've um, existed in corporate America and yes, it was there and I've existed in um, nonprofits, but especially poignant, I would say the uh, last six years. Interesting. Interesting, thank you Rose for sharing, very interesting. I'll, uh, I'll share some of my uh, characteristics. Um, I, I grew up in a, um, a Midwest town, Springfield, Illinois, uh, as a, a very white uh, community, even though there was a, a, a black community in the, in the, uh, in the city. Uh, I was in a Catholic grade school system where 98% of the people were white and uh, uh and and i had uh and it, i that really went on through high school as well basically uh very little interaction with anybody of any kind of different culture um and very naive um anyway and when i was in my early 20s i ended up uh, volunteering to work as a community organizer in um, brooklyn new york in a predominantly black neighborhood for two years um I call it my master's degree in reality. <clears throat> um, so anyway, I, and I'm now in my mid seventies with a daughter who is in a same sex marriage with two great grandchildren, uh, and uh, they're, they're wonderful children. My not great grandchildren, but they're wonderful little grandchildren. And um, uh, I am uh, so aware of the incredible you know, um, uh, benefits that I gained out of being white uh, that, uh, that that so many people have, don't have access to. It's, it's, a, it's a, a shocker to me. And I still associate with uh, primarily white folks. Um, uh, I don't live in a, a, a diversity, diverse uh, neighborhood or anything. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, that's, that's, uh, I'm a retired and uh, old guy, old white guy, and uh, that's how a lot of people just see me. I'll go next, and that's okay, Bob, to be an overtired white guy. It's okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> nothing you can do about that, actually. <laughs> yeah, out of our control. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm Evelyn, one of the organizers for uh, this anti-racist Jubilee Symposium, and we've just really been excited about this. I'm originally from Texas and um, grew up actually during the civil rights era. So a lot of my worldview, my perspective and the, everything that uh, I'm, uh, I guess, that's touched me has to do with that. And I would say too, if you know anything about the civil rights movement, you know that for African-Americans, the church was the starting place. Everything that was ever, how it just started there. And so I just remember as a kid going to church for every single event. Everything we heard about the next steps in the civil rights movement were shared with us in the church. That's not all that was shared. You know, it's just like uh, the, the I, I, I have, I think we all have what's called the non-negotiables. My non-negotiables go back to when I was three to five years old. That's when that development started. And I started uh, learning 
and, and needing to know more about how are we all included in this process called democracy? How are we all included in this, in, in this space called the United States of America? And so we learned about this in the church and it was taken outside the church to the school, to the neighborhood. You know, so my life was actually composed of those three components, church, school, neighborhood. The small area in Texas where everybody knew everybody and uh, the conversation was ongoing. And you might have heard me say this before. Even my 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 uh, my drive for to get people registered to vote, my drive for whatever it is, all goes back to that time in my life to where um, I saw my parents have to pay poll tax to vote, you know, and today we don't have to do that. But that still drives me to want to help other people. So um, I'm probably off topic here, but it's still part of the story that I feel like I have to tell when I talk about my characteristics and uh, because it's all part of my upbringing. And, um, you know, just Sometimes in this day and time, when you say you're a Christian, it's taboo, but that's my non-negotiable. I'm not going to be afraid of who I am because I have never asked anyone else to be afraid of who you are. So I think there has to be a fine line to where we actually have time to have discussion. And uh, you said earlier, Angela, to have open uh, discussions and have active listening in those discussions. Because if we don't have that active listening in discussions, we don't have anything but words, empty words that leave us all confused and upset. So I, I appreciate this training and I'm, I'm so open to learning more. And I, I didn't know what you were going to be bringing today, but this is what I needed to hear today. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I also want to thank you for sharing, Evelyn. I also want to note a couple of things that people have said today. So, for example, I said I grew up in the church. Evelyn, you did too. I can guarantee you our experiences were not the same. You know, even that, even though we have that commonality, our experiences are are not the same. Um, yeah. So the way, you know, the church I grew up in, I grew up Methodist. Um, I went to a non-denominational non-denominational youth group. Um, and then more as an adult, um, also because of the family I married into, again, marital status. Um, you know, I I lean, I go more toward Baptist church just because that's what he's affiliated with. And that's, you know, um, so again, you know, those things. They're nuances, but they really make up who you are. And those experiences, I can tell you, are very different. Um, as someone who's lived in Miami, I can tell you my experience from Paul's experience is, is probably going to be very, very different. You know, my living there, I lived there for three or four years. Um, I probably didn't experience the same things he did. Um, you know, again, we, we have something in common. It's not going to be the same experience. It's going to be different. Um, and I will also say my experience to, to Rose is similar. People confuse me with Latina. Um, and, you know, that's a very, but again, me and her, obviously we have very different ethnicities and we're still confused as Latina. Similar to Bob, I grew up in a mostly uh, Caucasian neighborhood. There was very, very few people of color. Um, so for me, you know, I, I got it kind of when I got to high school, there was more uh, flares of color, but the churches I grew up in, it was mostly Caucasian. Um, and I started branching out myself, um, you know, as I got older um, to just, you know, experience different cultures. But, you know, I, I mean, I have access to it because of where I live, but the neighborhood, the churches, my friends, those are they were mostly Caucasian. Um, and there wasn't, I mean, they, they each had their own stories. I, I did have a couple of European friends, military, you know, they all had their own individual stories as well. Um, but when I made more friends of color, um, you know, more, more fellow African friends, more, more black friends, you really notice the differences just, just there, um, and how they were raised their family structure versus mine. So there's a lot of little nuances that, just make, you know, everyone different. Um, yeah, can I share just another tidbit of my story too, growing up as far as uh, if we're going to use the word race or the, uh, ethnicity that I can't say very clearly. Uh, I just remember growing up that uh, we didn't talk about it a lot, but we talked about it enough that it affected me. My great grandfather was Irish. I knew my great grandmother, but I never met him because he passed away before I was born. But there was a lot of conversation about him. And it really, uh, it, 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 um, 
really guided me into thinking there's more because in Texas I grew up in like in basically an all black area went to an all black school but just the idea that my great grandfather was white there must be something else outside of this culture and I I you know in, in retrospect I think it was a driving factor to where I am today and to what I what I have learned about different cultures today I'm driven to learn about culture <laughs> I don't care who it is. And I think that if we do take the time to learn about culture, it will break down so much connotative, connotative assumption about people. Mm -hmm. We were talking about the food earlier, the geographical location. If we just took the time to learn and maybe even to taste and maybe even to go and have those conversations, it would break down so much. Because I've learned so much about the Irish culture because of my, grand, my great grandfather that I never knew, but I'm still part of that. You know, and it also has driven me to say, you know what, in my mind, I'm not going to allow you to think that you are better than me. You can put any kind of assumption you want on me, but in my mind, I cannot accept your um, your assumption of who I am or what I should be or what I must do just because my skin is black. Mm -hmm. So that's just a little more about my story that uh, maybe someday we'll get told. Could I just add something to what Ms. Evelyn just said that might be slightly off topic? It's not exactly about my characteristics, but it goes right with what she just said. My daughter, who's in eighth grade, is about to start a capstone project. And they this is going to tie around to what she was talking about. Um, they have to take on a project and find a mentor in that space and everything. And um, she's gone in a different direction, but she was down to two ideas. And the one idea she wanted to do was she wanted to come up with an app where um, people could, it wasn't a dating app, but in the same way that people could sign up to meet people from diverse backgrounds. And she thought that this could really help to fix a lot of what's going on in this country. Like, you know, you don't, maybe you don't have a chance to meet people who are different from you. And how would she get people to sign up for this? And actually, she was talking about Miss Evelyn. She was maybe going to have me um, reach out to you to be one of her mentors and Let's see if you can help her with Let's this. Let's do it. Well, she, she went in a different direction. But anyway, I just think that uh, that goes so well with what we're talking about. And I love that idea from her. And that is all. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, learning those different experiences, I mean, it, it's priceless. It gives you a really different sense of, you know, how other people outside of you, you know, grew up, were raised, you know, and the life that they lived, whether it's positive, negative, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I grew up <clears throat> obviously white um, in a very rural part of Indiana. <clears throat> and um, my mother was not from that area. Um, she had, she had been raised and we were, you know, grew up very much working class. And then, uh, my mother was not from that area and she came from a very culturally and ethnically diverse, um, place <laughs> in Akron and then in the, uh, Southwest, um, so she always, one of the good things she did was um, when some of these blanketed uh, racist or uh, biased things would come up, she would like call people out on it. Um, so I did at least grow up knowing that my microcosm that I lived in wasn't necessarily reality, but I, I also didn't know what that was. So, I mean, I think that, you know, college for me, um, again, another identifier, um, was something that helped me explore, um, you know, I was privileged enough to explore, you know, life and realize, oh gosh, I, I need, I need to know more and I need to seek this out. And I need, I, I don't want to live in rural America. I need to live, um, in a city or, you know, something like that. But I think the interesting thing for me right now, I mean, the more exploring that I do, um, 
the more it's like the more exploring you do, the more education, you know, you need, um, which I think is a really good thing. But I think the thing that I struggle with now is what to do with those people that I know will never change that I'm supposed to like their family. And, uh, that's what I struggle with. You know, I mean, it's, it's a huge inter, you know, and like when you were saying Angela that, you know, because I am a firm believer in uncomfortable conversations and in authentic conversations and making it okay to say things that I don't agree with, or that you don't agree with. I mean, just because that's how you learn. I mean, I remember like I grew up as a Christian. I'm not sure I could be classified any longer as a Christian. Um, but like some of my best conversations were with or about Christianity have been with super, super conservative Christians um, that we respected each other's space and boundaries and all of that. But there are these other people that you try to have conversations with that, you know, you know, my moral fiber says I should be um, friendly to these people, but they're not good people. <laughs> and I don't know how to reconcile that. And I know other people have got to have people in their lives like that. So, yeah, if anybody has any suggestions, I'm like, all ears. <laughs> um, I have dealt with a lot of that, I will say, uh, growing up, you know, biracial on both sides. Uh, there is, I will say there's, you know, it's both sides um, could have been like that. I, my mom's on the call. She can probably speak to that way more than I can because I just heard her stories um, of what she managed. And one of the things I kind of um, did, because I have family, I mean, I have family members. So when my my grandmother, my mom's mom passed away, um, I mean, they they know who I am. They know exactly who Angie is. That's the, what the family members call me. They didn't speak to me at the funeral. Like, and I didn't even, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this. Like, you, wow. But literally, okay, fine. So um, yeah, they spoke to my mom, but yeah, me, they, they, again, I guess they don't see color. They don't see me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I just chalked it up to that. Um, and I'm like, anyway, so from my experience, if you have people that are just, that's their boundary, then you, you got to respect it. And if you have to be in the same space of them, then be like, we are not going to talk. I mean, when it's your house, it's easier to call the shots. Like when you have that privilege, I will say, we are not going to talk about these topics. And if you do, you're gone. Right. So, you know, if you have, if you choose to continue to be in their space, I will say personally for me, I have chosen not to be in a lot of those spaces because I, I've tried and I've, I'm done. Like if you can't accept me for what this is, there's 8 billion other people in this world that might. So, you know, family included. So I, I just don't. Um, but if I have to, I'll be like, we are not going to talk about A, B, and C. And if you want to talk about it, then this is a conversation. These are the ground rules. You can, I can send you my slides. Like, you know, you force them into an open dialogue. And if you can't expect, respect those rules, then we don't talk about it. And, and then that's it because, you know, the boundaries and the rules go both ways. And if they don't respect you enough to abide by your as a, I'm going to say, as a, we talk about this, I mean, age matters. I'm a person. You know, I'm not, I'm not a 10 year old that you can boss around. If you can't expect me enough to give me that, then we probably shouldn't associate. And that's, you know, the approach I've taken family regardless or not. Yeah. I know. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. What, what I find though is that you're talking about boundaries and I think they're so critically important. I don't care what kind of space you're in. You've got to have the boundaries. But what happens when you have the boundaries is that you're still classified as being difficult or not condescending enough or and I don't care about those words. I've come to that place in my life that I really don't care about those words. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, when I set those boundaries, my shoulders felt so much better. 
and I could actually breathe easier. You know, and the thing of it that I've had to realize is that I cannot, for the life of me, make everybody happy. I cannot make everybody happy. I'm saying that for myself again right now. <laughs> Even though I am a so focused on uh, empathy, it just, some people are just not ready for even that part of what you're trying to give to them. So I just have to say, okay, this is for me. I'm not trying to be, I'm not better than, I'm not more than, but for me right now, this is what I have to do for my sanity. It's called a boundary. And they are not for you. It's for me. And even, like I said, even with that, I'll be repetitive here. People don't like for you to put up boundaries because then you know what? They lose that part of control of your life. So I'm thinking, nope, I haven't known you, but 10 seconds, you don't have that. You don't have the right to control that part of my life. I'm going to do this boundary for me. And it does feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the way you say that, Miss Evelyn, you know, because you are right. Absolutely right. They try to shove it off on you. I remember when I was a kid, the label my family would put on my mom was, and even she was a school teacher and even in her uh, classroom, like with other teachers that she was earthy. And it's like, what the hell does that even mean? But we knew it wasn't good, you know? And, and it was like, and so then people, you know, then when I grew up and then I was the one telling people, it's like, you can't say that, you know, at a, at a family reunion, then all of a sudden they would say, you're just like your mother. And I thought, yeah, I yeah, am. I'm pretty proud of that. But it still doesn't, it, you know, it's it's hard to like cut those people out of your, you know, like one of the things that I value most is family. But it's like when you have toxic family, that's not, yeah. That's yeah, their session, the I guess. So. That toxicity is to get help. I mean, I had yeah. to go through that, but like yeah. was to get help because there's a source of why they are so frustrated. You know, there's a source, there's a, whatever seed was planted, it's grown into yeah. whatever it is. Um, and all I can say is what, you know, and I've been, you know, at the end of that, and all I can say is, I don't know what happened to you in life, but I didn't do that to you. So you can, you can call me all the names that you want. But I, whatever you have going on, that, that's your problem. It's not your fault. It may not be your fault, but it's your problem to deal with. It's not mine. So, you know, that's the other thing I've had to realize is you, we all have our problems. Just don't, don't make your problems mine. And that's, you know, and, and there's books about that, you know, when, when it comes to race that, you know, it, now it goes both ways, but, you know is where does the problem really lie? Because I, I don't think it really is going to lie with race. There's something going on that you're frustrated and this is the scapegoat. And that's usually what it is. So, you know, until they take that journey to figure that out for themselves, you know, you can blame the world for your problems all you want. And the world might be part of it, but, you know, this is the world you live in and exist in. So how are we going to cohabitate? I have kind of a similar yet different question if anyone has any advice um not so much with my family but with my business and this is a place where I have a lot of intersectionality because I am obviously uh very progressive and and there's that whole part of my life but I sell endangered draft horses and so I'm constantly in a work way uh dealing with people from a totally different perspective and background and um the most of my baby horses I sell on Facebook and so I have to be on there and you get to see a window into who people are and so I get really um confused I guess about uh who I want to do business with and that's tricky so and then I'm like am I being part of the problem because I don't want to reach across and whatever, you know, because I see something not, of course, if I see something that's like outly racist or whatever, but, but a step back from that just hints into, you know, politically or otherwise, because that uh, tells you a lot about 
you know, again, like you don't want to be part of the problem and labeling people. But when people reach out to me about looking at a horse, I kind of look through and say, like, is this someone I even want to deal with? But then I'm also creating that two spaces. That, I don't know. I get very confused if anyone has any um, ideas. So I'm, I will say I'm a, I like, I'm a person about money. <laughs> um, so yeah, build your target market. You, you, you know, you've seen, you know, the target market where you have the small core, I did business school. So you have your small core, which is your target market. And then you have the ones out here, which you may get to, but if not, it's okay. And then you have everybody else. Um, so my suggestion there is figure out who your core target market is, who you want it to be, do the research, make sure that there's enough money in there for you. Um, and if they're going to help you pay your bills, you know, maybe just limit their interaction. Um, but yeah, 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 that, I mean, that's hard. Um, you know, dealing with biases at work, that's, that's essentially what you're talking about. How do I manage my biases? So how do I manage the biases at work? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, no, I mean, that that's essentially, yeah. Um, and, and there, I will say there, um, yeah, and, and, and they, I won't call them idiosyncrasies, but they are traits, the things that make up their secondary characteristics, right? Um, yeah, that's a hard, yeah, it's the checklist. And it's is such a small head. little niche thing, right? Yeah. Like I have four to eight babies to sell a year and mm -hmm. so many people reach out. And so then sometimes I'm just like, Mm, I don't, and I'm going to be dealing with them for the life of the horse, right? Like I want to be available yeah. and help them and whatever. And if they're icky to me, I, I just. So yeah. Why don't you develop a criteria list? You know, maybe there's one external that you actually show them. Um, and then there's one internal that you have for yourself. And if they don't meet those criteria. I guess that's what I've done. I just haven't put it on paper or said it out loud, but cause it's kind of. Yeah. But yeah. I guess that's sort of what I've done just instinctively. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Write it out. See what it looks like. See what's reasonable, what's feasible. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Does anybody else have anything they want to share? If not, yeah, we are at two or oh, one fifteen for some of you all. Yeah. Well, that is the conclusion of my presentation today. Um, again, the floor is open if anybody wants to share, you know, thoughts or, um, you know, where they see, you know, intersectionality or diversity, you know, coming into play. It's, you know, it's always, it's, it's going to continue to be a tricky thing. And as our world globalizes, um, it'll continue to be that. You know, crossing boundaries from one country to another is becoming, you know, a lot easier. <laughs> it's becoming a lot easier, a lot more popular. Um, so, yeah, as we see continuation of that, it's just going to be interesting to see what happens. I always say humanity has a long way to go, and we do. Well, thank you, Angela. I am just always so filled up when I uh, lead these conversations um, just for the training and uh, just from hearing you guys' stories about the training, it's just really, really empowering. So I, I appreciate everyone that's on this uh, call today and specifically you, Angela, for even putting the time into, this was a lot of information, a lot of very important information. So I, I thank you for that.